Every day, traders and investors dive in to tackle the ever-changing markets to find opportunity. Futures Radio Show is your number one source for answers to the questions that all market participants want to ask. Veteran futures trader Anthony Crudelli sits down with the most influential leaders and top traders in the industry. Now, here's your host, Anthony Crudelli. What's up, everybody? Anthony Crudelli here, and thank you for tuning in for this episode with Peter Bookvar. Futures Radio Show is sponsored by CME Group. They are the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world effectively manage risk. For access to free educational tools and resources for the active individual trader, please visit activetrader.cmegroup.com. Dot com. Remember, new shows are posted on Mondays and Thursdays. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, YouTube, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. If you're enjoying the show, please leave a review on iTunes. This show is also sponsored by Trading Technologies, FTSE Russell, and RJO Futures. Today, I spoke with the Chief Investment Officer at Bleakley Advisory Group, the editor of the book report, and CNBC contributor, Peter Bookvar. Today, Peter and I chatted about the lessons he learned from his mentors, Larry Lindsay and Leon Cooperman. Peter gives us his thoughts on the Fed and negative interest rates, equity reactions to the Fed and data, why the dollar is in a push and pull environment, and last but not least, reasons Peter is bullish, silver, and gold. So without further ado, let me take you right to the interview with Peter. Peter, welcome back to the show, my friend. Thanks, Anthony. I appreciate you having me on. It's great to speak with you again. Now, the last time you were on, it was you, Ira, and myself, and we were just talking about markets. And I've been following you for so many years, and a lot of times when I have people on the podcast, I like to really go into their backstory, find out how they got involved in financial markets. So, Peter, if you don't mind, take us back to the beginning. How did you get involved in financial markets? Well, I actually went to law school after college uh, for what ended up being one year because I wanted to be a sports agent, but not a lawyer, but a sports agent. But the summer after that first year of law school, I actually got a job at Donaldson, Lufkin, and Jenrette. The investment bank was eventually sold to Credit Suisse, and uh, I I was just going to be a a summer internship in the corporate uh, bond research department. And I ended up staying there for two years and never went back to law school. Uh, so I, I got my um, a lot of experience spending days doing uh, financial modeling and spreadsheets. And uh, then I went on to a firm called Miller Tabak, which was an institutional brokerage firm. And uh, I, I morphed into a macro strategist, an equity strategist, uh, actually managed some money there. Uh, and by the time I left, I had... I uh, was a portfolio manager with Miller Tedak Advisors in addition to other roles. And then from there, went to work for a very brief time with um, for Leon Cooperman at Omega Advisors, the hedge fund, as a, a macro strategist and a portfolio manager. And uh, from there, went to work for Larry Lindsay, who ran a firm called the Lindsay Group. Larry, for those that don't know, was a Federal Reserve governor in the 90s and was George W. Bush's senior economic advisor. He had a, a macroeconomic research firm uh, with many hedge funds, mutual funds, companies, countries as, as clients of ours, and I was the, the chief market analyst. Uh, but I wanted to manage money again, so uh, actually while I was there and separate from him, I uh, started a firm with, with a friend uh, uh, getting back into asset management. And then I took that and brought it over to, to Bleakley Advisory Group in uh, January 2018 and became the chief investment officer there, where I oversee the investment committee. We have probably have about $6 billion of assets under management, and I also manage two portfolio strategies. One's a global macro strategy, and another one is focused on income, whether it's fixed income, uh, preferred stock income, dividend income, um, in, in, in a particular strategy there. And, uh, and I also uh, write uh, a daily newsletter uh, called The Book Report, B-O-O-C-K Report, where I, I write about all the macroeconomic and market goings on and put my two cents on everything. Like I said, I follow pretty much everything that you put out. I really love your work. Uh, I think for a trader like myself who doesn't really 
know the macro that well, you're a great resource for me to, to really you make sense of it for me. So I appreciate what you do. Thanks. And I want to go back to like your early days because you really had two <laughs> really legend uh, mentors, Leon and Larry. Could you just give us one thing that each one of them taught you in your career? Um, I, I think it's really, it, it, it's getting in depth with the research, whether it was with, with, with Lee, the depth of the research of, of an investment idea, uh, or, or with Larry getting in depth with, with the research on uh, the, the macro economy or, and what, what, impacts, uh, what impact that can have on, on markets. And, and not really just look at things superficially, but, but digging underneath the hood and, and really fully understanding the story. Now, when you're dealing with in the world that we're in, you can obviously never know the detail of everything. You can't or else you would get every idea right. But just trying to know as much as you can and doing all your homework and, and really never leaving any, unstone, uh, you know, any stone unturned. I, I think that was really the key. And, and, and on top of that, just a lot of hard work. And, and, and having, you know, a passion for, for what you do. I mean, you look at Lee who just loved money management and loved the markets and it didn't matter how old he was. He was never looking on to retire one day. And, and he was always in front of his screens early morning and he spent most of his time in Florida, but when he was working when living in, in uh, when he was in New Jersey, he would be commuting to the city every day and getting on the ferry and getting on the train. And, and when you love what you do, uh, the work is really not considered work. Now it can be stressful and markets are stressful, but it's not considered work. And, and I think Larry Lindsay also has, you know, that same passion for, for information and curiosity and, and always trying to figure out not just what's going on, but what, what does this imply for the future? Yeah. If you want to be in this industry, you better passionate because it's going to put you to the test. No question about that. And thank you for sharing that with us, by the way. Now, you also mentioned knowing the full story. I mean, this is why I go to guys like you and Ira and Danielle DiMartino, or I'll, I can name a lot of people that I follow, to understand really the full story. So this past week, we had Paul come on and, and talk. What are your thoughts on what he said, and just in general, what the Fed has been doing thus far? Well, the, the Fed, of course, I, I refer to the Fed now as the lender of all resorts. You know, they, they were first created as, as supposed to be the lender of last resort, and, and now they're trying to be everything to everybody uh, in, in, in credit markets. And you know, I, I, I think that we have to understand the, the latest iteration of, of Fed um, action has been in the corporate bond market. And when you look back in March, what, what, was, what really went, went on in March that, that, that triggered this? It was basically a freezing of the market. And you had these major gaps between bid and offer. Buyers disappeared. Sellers were selling into a vacuum. And rather than really looking at why there weren't orderly markets, uh, the Fed just, their, their, their knee-jerk response is just to throw money at it, thinking that that helps to lubricate a market. But there has not been any discussion whatsoever over the last couple of months at maybe this is just the post post Volcker rule that that we're in. And that prior to this, you had major banks uh, being intermediaries in the corporate bond market and being the buyer to the seller and being the seller to the buyer and holding a lot of inventory and essentially being the, the, the world's market makers in corporate bonds. But no, there, there was no. Let, let's maybe revisit the Volcker rule and, and, and maybe, uh, I mean, Volcker has been a disaster because, I mean, we're all these years after and they don't even know what it is, uh, you know, and, and making markets is not why the financial system collapsed in 2008. So rather than, than, than really trying to figure out what was the heart of, of, of missing markets, the Fed just says, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll go in and, and we'll, 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 we'll make the market and therefore be the grease uh, to, to these wheels. So then you get to, it, it, it ends up becoming this, this slippery slope where there, there ends up being no market that the Fed won't enter. Now, we have to also understand the Fed did a complete runaround uh, of the Federal Reserve Act by, by creating the special purpose vehicle with the Treasury. Uh, and, and this is that central banks 
are so good at, at cutting rates and printing money and getting in to this type of easing. But it's proven that it's virtually impossible to get out. And you look at just the Fed had rates at zero for seven years, and, and the Fed was only moderately able to shrink their balance sheet, which is now obviously well above that. Uh, the ECB has had negative interest rates since 2014. The BOJ seemingly has been easing for 30 years. The Bank of England cut rates uh, from in 2007 from, I think it was around 5 or 6%. Uh, they cut rates down to 50 basis points, and they were only able to get that benchmark rate up to 75 basis points in the entire 10-year recovery. So these central banks just can never get out because then, in, because of all the debt buildup that they encourage through the easing, makes it even more difficult for them to eventually take away that stimulus and raise interest rates uh, without causing economic damage. So it's really a, 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 dis- a roach motel that they, they, they gotten themselves into and God knows how they would ever get out of it. I mean, just imagine what will happen to the European bond market when the ECB just tries to get back to zero interest rates, let alone positive interest rates. I'm talking about nominally. The other thing with Powell was, of course, the debate has been heating up on the efficacy of negative interest rates. And I, I don't think that it is any coincidence that literally days after the Fed funds futures at the time, it was the December contract that started to price in a negative Fed funds. And it was, it was slight. It wasn't anything no, uh, notable uh, in terms of, of, of the rate, but that it even started to price it in. You had uh, a bunch of Federal Reserve presidents and then followed by Powell in his, his teleconference uh, talking down negative interest rates. Now, I would have liked more forceful talk. I don't want to hear... We're not thinking about it for now. I want to hear we're not thinking about it ever because I think it's proven to be a a disastrous policy, and I refer to it as the dumbest idea in the history of economics. Yeah, I would say that was the the talk on FinTwit this week was, you know, just say say it. It's not going to happen, and he didn't. So you get back to they left the door open for it to be a possibility. Do you think that because – it sounded like he left the door open that that actually is something that they are considering. No, I actually don't think they're considering it at all right now. I, I think it's, um, it seems that across the board from comments from over the past week from Bullard, Evans, Bostic, um, uh, who's the, uh, Robert Kaplan, Mester, that I say Mester, um, uh, you know, Powell also. So I, I think you've, you, you've uh, had, had a slew of them say that we're, we're not, this is not something that we want to go to. First of all, I, I want to say central banks, as smart as they are, and as many PhDs are, 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 are within the institution, you know, they, they look at things simplistically, that high rates are bad, low rates are good. Well, if low rates are good, even lower rates are even better. And, if, and, 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 and why don't you just go to zero? And then, well, if, if, if zero rates are the great, well, then going even below zero is the best. Well, I argue that negative interest rates is no longer accommodated policy. It becomes restrictive because negative interest rates, you have to think at the end of the day, understand at the end of the day, it's a tax. It's a tax on capital. It's a tax on bank capital. So how would we extrapolate that a tax on bank capital is going to somehow be stimulative? Because that tax has to be eaten by somebody. It's going to be either eaten by the bank or the bank is going to pass it off onto the business or the household that is borrowing money from them. And all we have to do is look at the Japanese bank stocks over the last 30 years, where the Topics Bank Stock Index is down 90% in nominal terms from where it was in 1989. And the European, uh, the Eurostock Bank Index is down 80% from it was just in 2007. So if you want to destroy your banking system as they did, yeah. Go for negative interest rates. But if you want to avoid that, well, don't go to negative interest rates. I'm surely no economist, and I know that negative interest rates aren't any good. <laughs> you know, it's just, it, like you said, common sense, uh, I think, is it goes a long way. You don't have to be smart to know that. And I, I want to talk about exit strategy because, as you said, they really don't have an exit strategy. They have no idea, really, and I've heard this from multiple people. Now, 
looking at what has been done thus far with the Fed, are we in this mode now where it's back to don't fight the Fed? I mean, we've already seen it. As a trader, I could tell you, it just feels different the way it's trading now than obviously just a month ago. What are your thoughts on that? Well, we have to understand that the last two times the Fed resorted to extreme easing, it was in response to a recession in 2001, 2002, and of course in, in you know, 08, 09, or beginning actually late 07 when they started easing. And what happened was you had bouts of, of rallies, you know, each time there was an initiative, initiative that was um, announced or, or, or whatever. But the, fundament, the, the, the deteriorating economic fundamentals ended up taking over. And I unfortunately think that that will be the case again here, is that at the end of the day, it will be the economy and the direction of earnings that will overwhelm what the Fed is doing. Now, on the flip side, when the economy is growing and the Fed has easy policy, well, that's been, that's been a, a good environment for uh, markets, and, and, and that's when the don't fight the Fed thing is effective. So... I would really look at the game plan of the last two recessions in bear markets when the Fed was easing dramatically to see whether that actually helped markets. And you know, as we saw, it, it, at least in, in, in equities and parts of credit, that it did not. Uh, again, you're going to have vicious central bank um, driven rallies, but, but um, uh, the fundamentals end up taking over. I mean, look, look at all the things that the Fed has done already. And, you know, the S&P's are still below where they were uh, at the peak of just a few months ago. Look at the Nikkei after 30 years of, of monetary easing. Look at the European stock markets after all the easing. So in a, in, in, in a, in a growth phase, yeah, easy money, you can use it as a crutch, but now you, you better get your fundamentals right. Hey, everybody, a quick pause here to talk about FTSE Russell. They are a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. The Russell 2000 Index is a key benchmark for small cap U.S. stocks. Be sure to check out the E-mini Russell 2000 Index futures contract, symbol R-T-Y. For more information on FTSE Russell and their products, please visit FTSERussell.com. What it sounds like hearing you talk about this is, is that it's just a short-term fix, and what's going to happen is that the markets at some point, we don't know when that is, I wish I did, but the fundamentals of everything that, are, that is happening within the market is going to override it. Yeah, the, the, Fed, the Fed's liquidity policies, and I emphasize liquidity policies, can't print EBITDA that companies need to pay their obligations. It can't print jobs, and it can't print an antiviral and a vaccine. So until it can print those three things, understand that all they're doing is providing liquidity. But if the challenge right now is solvency and, and companies paying their bills, uh, liquidity is just not going to be enough to save that. Fed liquidity was not going to save JCPenney's business model. No matter how much they printed, no matter how many corporate bonds they bought, at some point that cash, that cash flow was going to run out and not be able to pay that those up their obligations. It's just fake it till you make it, and hopefully we give the markets enough time to turn around. Just buy the markets time. That, that that's that's what this is. That's what the fiscal uh, policy of, of the government has now become. It's about buying time to effective therapeutics and a vaccine. That's what this is about. And it's a, the question is is whether that that is that is enough to to bridge us. It's essentially a gigantic bridge loan. And, 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 and is that bridge far enough to get us to the other side, or is it not going to make it to land, and somehow people are going to have to swim to get there? Let's move on and talk about the dollar and gold. What are you seeing out there on the macroeconomic side of things that's telling you where you think the dollar and gold are headed? Let's just start off with the dollar. So. I, I like to look. I like to look at the dollar, not just as one homogeneous thing and say the dollar's up or the dollar's down. I really like to look at what's the dollar up against, what's the dollar down against, because we know at least the dollar index 
is very euro heavy. And, you, and, and let's, let's look at the dollar action against some of the currencies. The dollar euro cross has been basically in a range for years now. So for all the talk about the strong dollar, I mean, look at, look at everything Europe faces. Negative interest, a busted banking system, still high non-performing loans, sclerotic growth, and, and now obviously sharp declines, uh, a welfare state, uh, all these political problems. And you know what? The dollar is still in this 105, 115 range against the euro. The euro can't break down with all the crap that you can throw at the euro. You look at the pound. The pound is, is, is pretty much at the, you know, where it's been for the last year with, with all the worries about Brexit. And, and really, the, the, the discussions with the EU and Brexit is really the driver of the pound, not, not any strength in, in the dollar versus the pound. You look at the yen with, with everything the Bank of Japan has done, and their balance sheet is, is greater than the size of, 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 of GDP. And, and the yen trades pretty well against the dollar. You know, dollar strength has really been against uh, the, fl- the flawed and challenged emerging markets like Brazil and Turkey and South Africa. Uh, and, 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 it's, and, and it's traded better against some um, uh, Asian currencies. But even Asian currency has been mixed. And there was a run where the Thai bot was trading unbelievably against the dollar. But then the dollar was trading well against the in- Indonesian rupiah. So to me, the, the dollar is, yeah, it's up against some and it's in a trading range against the other. Uh, but I, I, I look at the action in the dollar as more of, of flaws and, and with other currencies, but the dollar has its own major flaws too, being the largest uh, debtor nation in the world and now having exploding debts and deficits. Oh, and one last thing, our two biggest trading partners. Yeah, the dollar traded well against the Mexican peso, but because a lot of that is the collapse in oil prices. Uh, the dollar versus the Canadian dollar, it's been in a 135, 145 range for years. It's so it, it, it's pretty much just in a range. So I, 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 that's how I like to break down the dollar rather than people saying, oh, the dollar should be strong. And I hear you know, all the time about the dollar shortage and that's going to be really bullish for the dollar. Um, well, yeah, but um, you know, when you look at a lot of the dollar denominated liabilities out there, I think people don't look at the flip side and look at the dollar denominated assets out there that a lot of foreign central bankers have because we're the largest debtor nation which means that foreigners are, are, are big creditors uh, of the U.S. and have dollar assets you know, on, uh, alongside a lot of these dollar-denominated debts. Now, with respect to the metals, I've been a, a big bull in gold and silver for years and remain so. And I think silver in particular is probably, in my opinion, the most compelling asset in the world right now. Okay, Why? <laughs> So uh, the silver has been weighed down over the past couple months because, you know, some days it trades like an industrial metal since half of its use is, is pretty much industrial metal demand. Uh, right now, well, that, a lot of that demand used to be film and cameras. Now it's solar panels, electric vehicles, batteries, electronics. Uh, so when the global economy collapsed, self-induced, of course, then you saw a, a big drop in the demand for silver. But then you have t- times when <clears throat> silver has a 4,000-year-plus four four history of being a monetary metal and being a form of money, which gold pretty much always is because of the very limited and tiny industrial uses that gold has. So now you have this disconnect where, the, going back to 19, the mid-1970s, call it 1975, let's just say, the, the average, and it's been above, it's been below, the average gold-to-silver ratio is about 60 times. Well, in March, that ratio got to 120 times. So double the normal average. So now this is, this is art, not science. It's a very simplistic way of, of sort of valuing silver. But because of thousands of years of monetary history, you could, you could still measure the relationship between the, the two precious metals and see how so quote unquote cheap silver is relative to gold. And now that you have the global economy, which I think is going to recover gradually over the next coming quarters, just for the sole purpose of when you reopen, you will certainly perform better than when you're closed, that um, silver will start to get 
back the benefit of being, yes, an investment metal and a monetary metal, but also as, as demand picks up for its industrial uses, uh, silver has a lot of opportunity here to catch up to the price of gold. With, with both still going higher, but silver uh, moving more higher from here uh, in, at an accelerated rate relative to gold. I just want to recap a couple of things. So when it comes to the dollar, really, it sounds to me as though you just see a push and pull market. It seems as though you think it's just rangy. I mean, look at the, look at the dollar index. Again, euro heavy. It's around 100, right? It's been, it's been this way for five years now. Yeah, no, I know it. I mean, when I look at the chart, I see the same thing. Yeah, and, and, and when, look in 08, when the whole world was melting down, the dollar was the safe haven. The dollar took off against everything. Now the dollar is, yeah, it's taken off against the Brazilian real and some commodity currencies, but it really, the dollar didn't perform this time around like it did in 08 as this great flight to safety. And I think that's in part to these exploding debts and deficits of the U.S. Yeah, because I hear the same thing you mentioned. I hear this a lot. Short-term dollar bullish, long-term dollar bearish. But every time I look at the dollar, I just look at it and go, it's just range bound. You know, it made that high and it, it's just kind of just sitting there. It's, it's grinding up a little bit, but for the most part, it just, we're stuck. Yeah, it, it, we're stuck. And let's just say you get a, an oil rally, uh, the bombed out oil, uh, where a, a rally in bombed out commodities if the economy starts to reopen again. Well, maybe you start to get some outperformance in commodity currencies and so there, there, to me, the, the, the dollar has been strong, again, strong against some, range bound against others, not trading well against others. So it, it, you really got to dig under the hood. As you said earlier, know the whole story. Yes. And mm -hmm. I, I want to talk a little bit more about gold. You've said you've been bullish gold. Obviously, I know that. I've been following you for a while. I know you've been bullish gold. And the recent price action, you, know, you see it, highest we've been in a while. What are your thoughts from here going forward on gold? Still just as bullish as you were then, or what are your thoughts? I, I am. I, I think the the interesting characteristic about gold, you know, we talk about the dollar. You know, everyone thinks that the gold really, in dollar terms, is just going to trade off the dollar, and that gold needs a weaker dollar in order to trade higher, which, yes, is one factor. So here you've had this so-called range-bound dollar, and, the, and gold has, has traded great, and that's because of falling real rates. So I would be looking at falling real rates right now, as, as, which has been the main driver of, of gold, and I expect that to continue because I, I think that the deflationary numbers that we're seeing right now at, at some point are going to reverse, and you're going to see even lower real rates. Um, and then if you do get any bouts of dollar weakness, that's just going to be a, a further catalyst to higher prices. So gold is really trading well against all currencies, which I think is, is sort of a, uh, a, a different type of behavior uh, than before, where you know, in every algorithm, gold would just trade contra to, to the dollar. Um, so you've had plenty of days and weeks where the dollar has actually traded pretty well, and, and gold has had a bid, as, has had a bid too. And again, I think that's because of falling real rates, and, and that's what gold really has a relationship to, not nominal rates, but real rates. Because I do, I, I, and we're already beginning to see, we are going to have, I don't know if it's the end of this year or it's going to be a 2021 story, we are going to have higher inflation because of the uh, mismatch that we're about to see in supply and demand, because we have broken supply chains everywhere that are going to take a long time to repair. And I think the demand side, while it will be muted, will still come back quicker than the supply side. I mean, you look at airlines. So airline traffic is down, I think, 90%. It's, now, it's slowly coming back, slowly. But because airlines have cut so much capacity that you're actually now seeing some full flights, you're actually seeing an uptick in airline prices. You go to the supermarket, and because of supply side disruptions, you're seeing a sharp rise in food prices. And we saw that in last week's CPI. You try to get a cargo ship to deliver you product if you, have a, if you source stuff in China or Vietnam or other parts of Asia, and that's going to cost you potentially 10 to 20% more because of all the cuts in capacity. So 
the demand side, while it doesn't have to be strong, as long as it comes back, which hopefully it will as the global economy reopens, I think it's going to take a while for the supply side to catch up to that. And also look at labor. You know, we're paying people in certain states up to $1,000 a week in unemployment benefits through the end of July. Well, if you're a restaurant or you're a business who wants to reopen and you want to get these people uh, out of unemployment and back onto your payroll, well, you're going to have to pay them extra wages. You can also assume that the cost of doing business now is only going higher to comply with these, this new COVID world, and your productivity is going to be much less than what it was. Well, you may try to offset those higher costs uh, to the consumer, which will lead to higher prices. So I see only an inflationary environment to follow here for those reasons that I stated. On top of all that, the, the, the monetary inflation that we've seen that's essentially tinder for consumer price inflation, that you can be sure central banks, particularly the Fed, will overstay their welcome with this type of easing. So that will then lead to even lower real rates, which will then be even more bullish for gold and silver. Hey, everybody. I want to take a quick pause and talk about RJO Futures. They are a long-standing brokerage firm with personal broker relationships to learn, discuss, and trade the futures markets. To learn more about RJO Futures, please visit rjofutures.com. Yeah, you make a great case for why gold should continue to go higher. I know that you're not a trader and you're not trading these all the time, but when you look at the price of gold, that 2011 high, it was around 2076. I'm assuming, <laughs> tell me if I'm wrong, but you think that that high is in reach and possibly even taken out. Yeah, I know that the spot rate got to around 1900. And, but yeah, so er, you know, every new bull market historically exceeds the previous bull market high if it's a secular bull market. And I think that's what we're in right now. And silver got to around $50 back in April 2011. And I think that that's a, a target as well from only $17 now. Yep. And you also mentioned data. And I want to talk to you about this because in a different conversation, I was actually talking to you about this. I said, look at on data days, I, I really almost not even looking at it or, or, or trading it, trading at those times because it's so difficult. You get these blowout bad numbers. We all know the data is bad, but as a trader, you're looking at it going, how could this not be bearish? But yet look at the jobless claims days. And I don't know what the stats are on this exactly, but I saw a tweet that's saying we've never been down <laughs> on a 3 million plus jobless claims day. So it's just for me, when I look at it, I just go, okay, that's the data. Go back to the charts. I can't even take it in and make any sense of it to make it any trades, not that I trade off data, but to even how it's going to influence the market that specific day. With everything that you're seeing, obviously this is something that we have never seen before. Is the market just looking at this data right now and, and saying, okay, we know it's bad, but at this point, this is not really going to tell us too much. It gives us some part of the story. We have to wait until X time to really find out what the damage is. Do you think that's maybe why equities are shrugging things off? I'm just curious, how are you looking at all the data and how the market's reacting to it? Well, I think you're right. And, and, and the analogy that, I, that I've been giving to, to people the past week is that if I bang my head against the wall, I'm going to get a headache. But I'm not analyzing why I got the headache. I know why. I'm trying to figure out how long the pain is going to last and when is it going to go away. So when we shut down the economy on purpose, we banged our head, our head against the wall. So we're not analyzing why we got the headache. I'm not going to analyze why jobless claims are 3 million or 5 million or 6 million because we did it on purpose. We shut the economy down in order to contain the virus. So that's why the market doesn't care about these numbers because they know we did it. We, we, it was self-inflicted. It wasn't like the, 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 the natural economic cycle took its course and led to this collapse. It was self-imposed. Therefore, look at what ha what's the economy going to look at after the reopening. And, and then we can look around and look at the economic data for what it is and not blame it on a, a forced shutdown. Now, I think that's the sort of the uh, dichotomy here between the bond market and the stock market, where the stock market right now is only seemingly trading off the reopening. 
where the bond market is is saying, okay, yeah, we're reopening. And when I say the bond market, I'm talking about a 10-year yield at only 63, 64 basis points, not far above where it was at uh, in, in, in mid-March when it was like 57 basis points. The bond market is saying, uh, on a closing basis, I think got below that on intraday, the bond market is saying, yeah, we're going to reopen, but man, th- th- this rate of growth is going to be really pathetic. Now, at some point, the stock market, I don't know if it's it's in a couple of weeks or it's in a couple of months when, when we are reopening and we're are reopened, most things, not large gatherings, but everything else. And they're going to look around and say, wow, this is, this is really going to be a, a tough economy for a while. That's the next challenge for the stock market. So this is the same sort of um, uh, go your own way approach that we saw in January and February where bond market yields kept falling while the stock market kept rallying. That's one of the best explanations I've heard on really dissecting the data. Thank you so much for sharing that with me. And I could be picking your brain all day about all this stuff, but I got to move on to some rapid fire questions next. If you're ready for those. Sure. Let's do it. All right, everybody. Our rapid fire segment is sponsored by trading technologies, trade the global markets with TT. They are the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. Now with integrated tools for advanced options trading, cryptocurrencies, and trade surveillance. Try it now for free at tryttnow.com. Peter, first question for you. What trader has influenced your career the most and why? I, I, I don't think personally, but from my readings, I always enjoyed the old school guys like Jim Rogers and Soros and Paul Tudor Jones and and, and while I'm a, a longer term, short term macro guy is always fascinating me. But you know, Warren Buffett to me and how he analyzed the business and, and the type of investments he found attractive, that's always embedded in my mind. What was one of the hardest things for you to overcome working in financial markets? Um, the ability to admit that you're wrong and, and to take that early loss. What is one attribute that you believe every trader should have? I, I would say the same answer is the ability to admit that you're wrong and, and take that early loss. Uh, because if you take care of the downside, the upside will take care of itself. Favorite book about trading? Market Wizards. If you had to pick a profession other than working in financial markets, what would it be? I would love to be in sports in some way, the business of sports, whether it was uh, being a sports agent, which I wanted to be many years ago, or working for a team or working for a league. Uh, I'm a sports fan, so while I was ne- never good enough to do it uh, on any basis other than high school, uh, I would have loved to have been in the business of sports. I love sports too, and actually tomorrow NASCAR is coming on, and I haven't watched NASCAR in years, and I can't wait to watch it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that'll be fun to see live sports again. Yep. What's the best piece of advice you received about trading? Uh, be hugely disciplined and work, 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 read, read, read. If you could go back in time and give the younger you a piece of advice about financial markets, what would it be? Be humble. If you had an elevator pitch me your edge in covering financial markets, what would you say? Uh, I would answer that the same way, is, is be humble. Uh, you, you're never going to be right all the time. Uh, always question your thesis. And the upside, again, will take care of itself. Last question for today, Peter. Favorite thing to do when you're not working? Um, well, I'm always working in some way. But um, I'm just as happy sitting on the couch watching a good movie or watching a good game. Peter, where can fi- people find you on Twitter and give us a website to check out? So Twitter is at pbookvar, and that's B-O-O-C-K, V as in Victor, A-R. Uh, they can subscribe to my newsletter if they, if they choose at bookreport.com, B-O-O-C-K, report.com. And... Uh, if they're interested in money management advice, they can reach me at the uh, Bleakley Advisory Group. Peter, I always learned a ton from you. Learned a ton from you again today. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me on a Saturday on Futures Radio Show. Thanks, Anthony. Always fun. 
Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a review on iTunes. You can listen to all of our episodes on futuresradioshow.com, iTunes, YouTube, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher.